our meeting. And say hello and welcome to everybody for joining us for this event with Dr. Rebecca Huntley. Um, my name is Luke Whitington. I'm the Executive Officer of the Search Foundation and I'm your host for the event. Uh, before we begin, please be aware that this briefing public forum is being recorded so we can post it later to the Search Foundation YouTube channel. I'll post a link to that in the chat section. Indeed, I'll post links to lots of things in the chat section, including the link to uh, get your own copy of the book. So don't worry if you miss a reference while I am speaking. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging, as we always do, that we're meeting here in Australia on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. Sovereignty of this land was never ceded. This land was taken without consent, without treaty and without compensation. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, traditional owners and First Nations all across the continent. I'm on Gundungurra and Darug land where we say Warami Gamarada, welcome comrades. We're very lucky to have Rebecca Huntley with us tonight, but before we get into that, first I'll tell everyone about the event and then give a 30 second intro to search and then a one minute intro to Rebecca Huntley and her book. Rebecca will then speak for around 20, 25 minutes. After that, we'll have questions, which I invite you to submit to me in writing in the chat section directly. We'll wrap up on the hour uh, when you can hang up or stay on the line for a few minutes to listen to a song, during which time you can post messages to everyone, including Rebecca, in the chat section. Uh, all participants will be muted unless called upon to ask a question. After you've asked your question, please mute yourself again. Uh, when you submit your question, please let me know if you're happy to ask the question yourself or if you'd like me to ask it on your behalf. The chat section is limited to messages to me as host until the very end when we open it up and you can message anyone you like. So a quick introduction to SEARCH. SEARCH is a membership-based democratic socialist organisation that links and enables socialist activists across political parties, generations and movements all around Australia. We have a diverse membership, but we have common values, summarising our goal of democratic ecological socialism. We run socialist education programs, publish news and views on Facebook and at search.org.au, and we put on events like this one. This event is the latest in a series, which has included Adam Band, Bernard Caleri, Sharon Burrow, and Michelle O'Neill, just to name a few. I encourage you to like the Search Facebook page to keep up with our events and go to search.org.au if you're interested in applying for membership. Our contact details are on the website and our Facebook page if you'd like to talk to me about any event or our education program or any other matter. Now to introduce Rebecca Huntley and how to talk about climate change in a way that makes a difference. Rebecca Huntley is one of Australia's most experienced social researchers. She is the former director of the Mind and Mood Report, the longest running measure of the nation's attitudes and trends. She holds degrees in law and film studies and a PhD in gender studies and is a mum to three young children. It was realising that she is part of the problem that caused her to de dedicate herself to researching our attitudes to climate change. She is a member of Al Gore's Climate Reality Corps, carries out social research for NGOs such as the Wilderness Society and WWF, and I just heard the National Nature Conservation Council, and writes and presents for the ABC. Uh, this is not her sixth book, it's her latest book, um, and so about the book. Why is it so hard to talk about climate change? While science, scientists double down on the shocking figures, we still find ourselves unable to discuss climate change meaningfully among friends and neighbours or even to grapple with it ourselves. The book argues the key to progress on climate change is the psychology of human attitudes and our ability to change. Whether you're already alarmed and engaged with the issue, concerned but disengaged, a passive skeptic or an active denier, understanding our emotional reactions to climate change, why it makes us anxious, fearful, angry or detached, is critical to coping on an individual level and convincing each other to act. This book is about understanding why people who aren't like you feel the way they do and learning to talk to them effectively. What we need are thousands, if not millions of everyday conversations about the climate to enlarge the ranks of the concerned, engage the disengaged and persuade the cautious of the need for action. This is it here. I'll post a link so you can get uh, your own copy right now. So Rebecca Huntley, thank you for being with us tonight. How do we talk about climate change in a way that makes a difference? Ah, well, that's a spoiler. Uh, <laughs> spoiler alert. I want people to buy the book. I'm only joking. Um, look, I've done, this is kind of, I was saying to Luke, this has been probably my eighth week of doing interviews, podcasts and Zoom events such as this about the book. And I thought I'd take a slightly different approach given um, the audience that I can see and anticipate um, will be listening to me tonight 
and also a reflection of um, you know the fact that many people on the line are comrades from the union movement and more broadly from the socialist left or the progressive left of the Labor Party, which is how Luke and I first met many years ago, Bondi branch of, um, of uh, the Labor Party. Um, so what I wanted to really talk a little bit about tonight is the role of identity and emotion in climate activism. Because the book is very much um, was very much triggered by a, a, per, a very profound shift um, from me being somebody who identified strongly as a labour person um, and to somebody who found themselves in the environment movement, which is a very surprising shift. I think back on you know what got me involved in politics so many years ago. Um, you know, when I was 19 and first thought that I would join the Labor Party. Um, and that was the early inspiration of Gough Whitlam, but also remembering, you know, as a teen, as a young, as a child and, you know, teenager growing up under a um, Hawke Keating government and having a particular kind of view of the Labor Party, which meant that I, I fell in love with the Labor Party, but with the left of the Labor Party. And the things that drove me to become a Labor Party member and activist were very much around um, uh, social justice, um, class politics and feminism. I mean, interestingly at the time, and so many people would have a much clearer memory about it than me, even though I'm kind of headed towards 50, is that, you know, an environmental agenda was there in the Labor Party's agenda in the 80s. And in fact, a very, cl very clear memories of the activism around the Frank Franklin Dam. But even though I said that I cared about nature and, you know, worried about the natural world. My identity was very much tied up in class and gender, and I didn't see the environment as playing much of a part in that. And of course, years of labour activism, particularly on um, campus, university campuses and then in the left, is so much about, um, not so much about, not just about opposing conservatives, but also fighting with the Greens. <laughs> so for me, there was this other thing, this was really a, a, this, which was something about partisan politics and the way that politics was structured in the 80s and 90s, that if, while I was concerned about um, nature, I would never have thought that I was an environmentalist. So how did I become a climate activist, which is what I am now and has actually been a very, very recent um, shift for me. There's been a profound shift at the last two and a half years. I mean, really, if you'd said to me three or four years ago that I would become a climate activist, that all my work would be around climate change and that I would spend all my time with climate activists, um, I just wouldn't have believed it. Um, so thinking about what that trajectory, how that, that moment has arrived for me and it's so much about the reason why I wrote the book, is really interesting because as soon as I found out about climate change and understood it, there was nothing that made me reject the reality of climate change. I accepted it. Um, and there's so many reasons why I'm prone to, suggest, to um, accept the reality of climate change. I'm highly educated. So the more educated you are, the more you um, are likely to accept that climate change is a real thing. I'm a woman and there's a lot of the research shows women are slightly more likely <laughs> to be open to accepting climate change or thinking that government should do about it. And I was already progressive, so I didn't have any kind of ideological opposition to the idea that government should be able to control the market to make sure that for the benefit of the vast majority of people and there should be limitations on what corporations should do in terms of, you know, the exploitation of either human capital or, you know, our natural resources. All the rest of that was kind of um, pushing me into the direction of believing climate change was real, wanting the government to do it. And it wasn't that it wasn't significant for me as I voted, but I voted for the Labor Party because I always have. Climate wasn't driving that. And certainly an appreciation and understanding of the climate science wasn't um, the lens through which I saw my entire life. There were moments, and I write about it at the beginning of the book, where, you know, there were flickers of and these weren't intellectual moments, these were entirely personal, ethical, emotional moments where 
the reality of climate change kind of hit me, but often fleetingly. So I talk about um, snorkeling in the Great Barrier Reef with my five-year-old and how wonderful that was. But there was this moment where I thought, you know, because when you think about things that you do with your children, you hope that one day they'll do it with their children. And I thought, will there be a reef to see? Will she want to have children? Because will there be a world in which she'll want to bring children into? So that was a moment, but it was fleeting. Um, and there was certainly an, an, an intellectual engagement with the critically, with the, with the difficulty of selling climate action to the electorate in Australia, which came with the election loss of last year. And if people remember, there was so much media saying, you know, all the polls are saying that climate change is important. This is going to be the climate election. It really wasn't. And, you know, I wrote a quarterly essay in the lead up to that um, election that kind of took all the polls at face value and thought we were headed for a Bill Shorten Labor government and that's not what happened. But it was, and that was, you know, devastating for a lot of people in, at different levels. But for me, it was also a, a moment as a social and market researcher to realise that the way in which we had, um, not just that, you know, our polling samples had some problems and there were some various problems with the way that we collect data at the moment and that that fail was always going to come in Australia because it had come elsewhere. We'd been a bit buffered from it, mainly because we have compulsory voting, not because necessarily our techniques are that much better, but we have no problems with turnout algorithms, which they often have in other elections, in other, um, in other uh, elections in other places, which I can talk about in a minute, if people are interested. No, there was this moment where I thought, I believe that when you poll people and they say, do you think climate change is real, that we're making a contribution, that government should do something about it, and it's a problem. I don't believe that people are lying. I believe there is a disconnect from when they answer those questions to when they live their life, when they go into a polling booth, when they make a decision about a car, when they do anything, that that is the disconnect. Not that they're lying and they're saying that they care, but they don't. Um, they're looking for a pathway, pathway between belief and action, which has always been at the heart of trying to make any, um, any population bring about change and pay the change. So I realised that for years I've been doing surveys that ask people about their views about climate change and years of doing focus groups about what messages, you know, people would respond to. And I realised that there had to be something different had to happen. We had to find new ways. Um, to do this research on climate and to furnish the movement and any political party that takes climate seriously with better, more sophisticated research on attitudes and advocacy. But the real, the real shift for me actually came with watching um, the students' climate strike, the second one. And, and I write about it in the book, and actually, when I read that part of the book, which I hate, I hate kind of reading my books um, after I've written them. It's kind of like drinking your own vomit. But occasionally, I have to do that. <laughs> and when I when I when I've read it out, I still feel that physical um, sensation that happened that morning, which was watching these young, vibrant, um, you know, energetic. And quite diverse young people, you know, they were, they just looked like the kids who walk past my house, you know, to get to school in the morning. They look like a slightly older version of the friends of my 12 year old. They didn't look like, you know, um, professional protesters in any way. They just looked like ordinary kids with um, very funny, but also quite dark signs. And I felt an immediate sense of needing to respond to their plea, their earnest plea, which is do something. There's not much we can do, but for whatever, you know, the parent and grandparent generation, you can do something, please do something. And at that moment, I kind of went from concerned about environment, but saw environment entirely through the frame of being a labor person to and stop being a labor person, but a 100% committed climate change activist. So it was quite an interesting, it was not an intellectual transition. So I didn't believe the climate science more that day than I did before. 
Um, I didn't have any different views about government, about power of my vote. Um, I had a kind of an identity shift that was triggered by an emotional reaction to the activism of young people like my children. So I identified quite strongly with that moment as a parent and kind of saw my climate activism quite in the same way as I see anything else that I do for my kids and their community around them, you know, make sure they're well educated, make sure they cross the road, that kind of thing. It was fascinating to me that that move from what we would say concerned to alarmed about climate and engaged was an emotional response rather than an intellectual response. Now, that doesn't mean that for other people, it hasn't been an intellectual response. You know, you have met people who have read an ICPP report or whatever, or they've engaged with the science and thought, wow, you know, I'm going to get involved. But in all the interviews that I do and all the interviews I've done with activists, it is often a kind of a flash moment, a flash kind of a flash point of significance and relevance of climate change to their life, which could be seeing it manifested in their farm, um, watching it eat away at their um, community, their village, watching their livelihood um, go up in flames, um, seeing an image on television of a place that they've travelled that they love. Um, it can kind of be anything, but there has to be that emotional and personal relevant connection. And indeed, in the and so once that client, once I'd done that, really kind of everything changed. My professional life changed. Um, I changed a whole that that very day. I completely changed the way my super was structured and my husband's super was structured. We changed a whole range of decisions that we were going to make about. Um, you know, that our, our spending priorities for the next couple of years, um, you know, as a big, I started eating less meat, so doing a whole range of things, all things I knew I should have done before and would have agreed with, but, but change. So coming out of that, um, I decided to write a book which was about this emotional transition, but also kind of really looked at the importance of identity, politics and emotion as a frame of which, through which to understand people's response to climate change and to help us understand therefore how to communicate about it better and how to bring about that change in as many people as possible. And so I went to, um, so as part of the research for the book, I went to Yale University, which for about 12 years has um, had what's called the Six Americas study, which is segmentation of their population, which kind of pulls people into kind of archetypes in terms of how they feel about climate change and their behaviour. And uh, I talk a bit about it in the book and, um, the, uh, uh, and we've just replicated that study in Australia and are starting to talk about it quite broadly in the movement and we'll be talking about it more broadly. And there may be in fact people on the call who've heard about it. But um, one of the things that's so interesting about this segmentation, which really kind of reinforces for me, why, um, why understanding the emotional, political, ideological worldview frame around climate change is critical to talking about it because, um, uh, because that's the thing that's driving people's response to climate, not their understanding of the science, not even sometimes the acceptance of the science because pretty much 90% of the population um, don't resist the science. What they what they um, what they resist is what happens next after you absorb the science. Which is why more science is not going to convince more people. Um, better communicators, more effective messages, that, um, tap into where people are and and enable them to think about what they can do. And one of the things that, so before I kind of um, finish up and restart, have questions, one of the things that um, is coming out of that research and coming out of um, so much of the research that we're doing, so much of the segmentations that have been done not only in Australia but globally, is one of the big things that differentiates you into these different segments from people who are alarmed, which is quite a 
I mean, they're basically over half the population is either alarmed, alert, or concerned about climate. There's probably about another quarter that would describe themselves as cautious about climate. So I believe climate change is real, but very worried about the transition and the impact of the transition on jobs, the economy, and quite cautious too about whether the technology is in place to make that transition. Interestingly, that group of the cautious were the ones that voted in the greatest number, at the greatest proportion, the most significant quantum um, for Morrison in the last election. So we kind of think about people who are going to, you know, kind of support the conservatives on climate as deniers or doubtful. Really, it is people who are cautious. They're really worried and they're probably more cautious now given the pandemic. But one of the, most, the critical things that, that sorts these different groups of Australians into these groups on climate is whether they think climate change will affect them personally. Whether they make the connection from the science and the reality of climate change to their own world. And what has been replicated time and time again in studies, particularly done in areas where that have been affected quite, quite significantly by um, extreme weather caused by climate change, whether that be a tornado or floods or, um, uh, or fires. Is you can have a community that's been ravaged by these impacts of climate change. You can say to them, do you believe in climate change? Yes. Do you believe people are going, you know, we're making a contribution to it, yes. Do you believe that because of climate change there are going to be more fires and floods? Oh, absolutely. Do you believe this was caused by climate change, this flood that wiped away your house? Oh, no. So you can, you can take them all the way up to that point. The thing that has devastated their um, life, they push away. And that is a psychological response. Right? There's no logic to that. You can't say that those people are stupid. It's absolutely a psychological response which has been found to exist in the fires that we've just had over the summer. And I've done quite a bit of research to see whether people who were previously cautious, disengaged from climate, whether that was a tipping point for them, not at all. The fires only really managed to move people who were um, already on a trajectory to being alarmed about climate, move them there quicker. So it was a tipping point, probably one of the things that drove that move of concern to alarm. But the idea that extreme weather events, when they affect people, are going to change people's minds on climate, just ignores the, the, the way in which we respond psychologically to these kinds of issues, as well as to climate more broadly. So what was really clear to me, looking at that research and then thinking about my own, my own response, is that I went from concerned, but really not that engaged and active on climate, to alarmed and active because it was sudden, it suddenly felt imminent and pressing. It suddenly felt personal and it suddenly felt relevant. Because it suddenly felt like something that I needed to do, a contribution that I needed to make. I needed to be part of the movement so I could look my children in the eye and say, I tried really hard as part of a larger movement to create a livable world for you. Not just to give you a good education or you know, make sure that you've got good teeth and we took you to the orthodontist or whatever, so you have a nice smile, but I was part of this. So it felt like a profound um, ethical and moral responsibility to my children, which is not something I felt previously. So that sense of relevance, it's of relevant to me will impact me, is absolutely critical to not whether people think climate change is real, but whether they're prepared to do something about it. And so we are now at a point not of measuring people's belief in climate change, but their belief that solutions are, that are possible and that they can be part of the solution. So that's all my work at the moment that I'm doing. Just finally, before we stop, it could have been, I mean, this move, this shift in my life happened before the fires um, over the summer. I actually wrote the book in the fires. I researched it over a year and had about five weeks to write it and I wrote it in five weeks. So if there are a few errors, be kind. Because <laughs> there was also our air conditioning broke. <laughs> so I wrote it in five weeks with no air conditioning, with three children in the house, still cooking and cleaning. Yeah.
it was quite hard. It was quite hard. It was difficult. I think it kind of broke my brain at the end of it. It may never have healed. Um, and it could have been, so the fires just reinforced for me as I was writing the book, you know, I was watching it play out, particularly on social media, is people's response to it. And you could see, you know, the diverse response to it was not about the reality of the fires, but so much about the worldview, the ideology, the emotions you could see play out. Unfortunately, this is a bit of a side um, sidebar, but what is clear from all the research I've done and has been done on the fires is that um, the impact of the circulation of stories on social media about the fires being about fuel load or arsonists was extraordinarily effective. You don't need to you don't need to subscribe to the Australian to be influenced by their narrative because it's amplified on social media, and that's what we found. The people most likely to continue to share, share, share this kind of research, this kind of you know narrative about climate change not being a real thing, are often the doubtful and the dismissive. The people in the middle who are concerned and don't know how to talk about it, very you know not going to not going to circulate that, that as much. So there's a social media is a very hard place to have a conversation about climate change, but it's still an important place for so many reasons because it plays a role. So watching the fires. Um, play out could have been a trigger for me and had already kind of come across in many ways but have met over the course of um, the research for the book and the work I'm doing lots of people who kind of jumped from being concerned about climate to genuinely alarmed and thinking about well, what is it that I can do in my life as a whatever I am to make a contribution and, and let's not underestimate that we don't there is something about an extreme weather event of this kind that can galvanise not masses of people, but enough different kinds of people who then start to become part of the movement, make their contribution, help renew the movement. And indeed, the Sunrise um, project, which I'm involved in, was just kind of inundated with all different kinds of people. So, you know, um, many of them um, not friends of socialism necessarily, you know, a whole lot of ad agency guys who are like, oh, I'm really worried, what can I do, what ad can I make, and people in the finance sector and all the rest of it wanting to make a contribution, that's, a bit, that's not a bad thing. So, um, yeah, so I might end, I've talked for much longer than I thought, but I, I really wanted to share with um, this particular kind of group, the kind of complex story of how I went from being um, you know, somebody who never thought they'd be a climate activist to a climate activist, which is very a personal story, but also illustrates a lot of the kind of key, the, all of the insights from the research about how we need to talk to people and how identity, emotion, and our political worldview structures our approach to climate change much more than just merely our understanding of the science. Thank you very much for that. Brilliant. Um, one problem with Zoom is that not everyone can do spontaneous applause and thank you very, very much. But, that's um, right. If you want to send little messages, that's fine in the chat. Sorry, we'll <laughs> oh, well, somebody, somebody just did. <clears throat> it's probably just Michael, me. Michael, I, I saw the little, little, I saw the fairy plant. Oh, uh, yes, that's right. You can do those reacts. We've got well over 200 people. Oh, and at, then somebody did a little emoji. Thank on you. On the line, which is fantastic. We've got dozens of questions already coming through. Right. You can click plug, there's the book, and it's uh, the, the link to get your own copy is there in the chat right now. Um, I forgot to mention, I'm deeply apologetic, this, this is, event has been co-hosted by our partners at the New International Bookshop in Melbourne, where you can get the book. Um, so the link... Yay, Melbourne. <laughs> good on you, comrades. Um, and we have a question from Maddie Goulet, who's the coordinator of the, uh, the bookshop, actually, so we'll get to her in a second. Um, but that was brilliant. I've got a first question, uh, it's from Belinda. And uh, I'll unmute her now and she can ask her question um, of you when she gets the call, as it were. So go ahead. Hi, hi Belinda. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, thanks, Rebecca. I love your book. I'm up to <laughs> Lost. So thank you so ah, much right. for writing this book. Lost is my favourite chapter, right? For many reasons, but anyway. Um, I wanted to know... The, tech, the messaging strategies that other organisations that have used in the past 
past around health, like, um, I don't know if you remember the, or if people in the audience remember, um, the work cover ad, you know, the one yeah. with the boy sitting on the front of the house waiting for dad to come home every day. Yeah. And then one, dad comes home every day and then one day he doesn't, the police do. Yeah. Or those ads, like the TAC ads have been, from what I understand in my work in health promotion, that uh, those ads have been very effective um, because there's been massive funding behind those campaigns. But they've been very effective in um, reducing the road toll and yeah. getting message across about road safety. So in, in terms of getting the message across to as many yeah. people as you can, is that, would that work in this context? Look, it's a really good point because actually the, the climate segmentation used by, at, by Yale, they, they took their lead from the kinds of segmentations that are used in health prevention. So recognising that at the outlook, so if you, if you think about it, you want everybody to stop smoking, right? Dr there are different drivers for different people to stop smoking, right? You're never gonna have, like, the, the, why do we want people to stop smoking? Because it gives you cancer. But really, that doesn't work. Just telling everybody that smoking gives you cancer is not gonna work. You have to understand what the trigger is to engage with the science that, that smoking gives you cancer. So in a sense, the health, health prevention segmentation that had been in, in place for some time, like it's been used for some time, was a bit of a model for this kind of work. Now, of course, because health prevention, um, health prevention has a lot of, uh, you know, because, because, well, so let me say it another way. Because cl the climate movement is run by campaigners that want to run big, big campaigns, the idea that you would get use, send different messages to different groups was difficult for people. People thought, oh, well, where are we? Like, how can we talk about the importance of Australia being an independent, sovereign energy nation and go Australia and not even mention emissions or the coal industry or whatever and use this language for this group and use a completely different language for the other? And I understand that. But in the end, if we're all pushing them to do the same thing in the end, I don't think it matters. I, mean, I have never seen it matter much at the, at the, at the level of the um, citizens that are in groups. So I think that... I think that the kind of health prevention, the work, the success of health prevention using a segmented approach and lots of different messages to push different communities to do the same thing is an inspiration for the kind of climate work we do. And as all of our agencies said, there's never been a better time to micro-target, right? Because everybody's media consumption is actually quite um, tailored, right? So that's the other thing that we're finding is that different groups use different media, um, are influenced by different media on climate change. And so we can target things more effectively. So I absolutely, I absolutely think that we have to try the multi-pronged approach around messaging. Um, and a multi-pronged approach around messaging is not the same as saying, we're, we're suggesting a whole lot of different, we're being disingenuous about policy options. We do have to move away from fossil fuels. We do have to invest more in, in renewable energy. We do need to take our target seriously. Um, all of that kind of stuff. But I actually think that because what I've seen, for example, is I've seen messaging around a Green New Deal work extremely well with parts of the alarmed and get other groups so befuddled and upset that they can't engage with the climate message. It becomes an incredible motivator for some groups of the community and an absolute barrier for the others. And I suppose I am a bit pragmatic in that I, I don't, there isn't a day where I don't think we've got 10 years because that's what we've got. So <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit about how do we meet different groups where they are already just to, just to be able to, because we've lost so much time. So it's a really good point because I think we can be inspired by the health prevention approach and how they've effectively used segmentation um, for a whole range of behaviour change um, campaigns over time. A question that's uh, related to that from uh, next one up from Maddie Goulet, who is the coordinator, as I said, for 
the New International Bookshop, where you can buy a copy of the book, both online and soon, hopefully, in person. Uh, so go ahead, Maddie. Where's Maddie? Hi, Maddie. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was such a wonderful talk. Um, I was just wondering, as emotional responses are the individual influence to sort of implementing change, how can we also pursue corporations and big businesses to get them to actively change? I mean, like, especially with the monetary value that comes in with, like, biz big businesses like coal, how do yeah. we influence them? Yeah. So, look, I am... I think there's... I think it's really hard to get... Um, these people to behave not like sociopaths. But um, I think there are some really interesting and, you know, really interesting examples of what can shift. And this and and real and there's been a lot of you know work done by the climate movement, smart work done to get people to shift. Um, I don't know if people watched, but the Farmers Federation came out with an extremely strong statement. Um, I think last week around um, zero emissions and a target around zero emissions probably pissed off a lot of people in the National Party. That's been the work of many, many months to get them to that point. Um, not a corporation, but certainly a really, really important external stakeholder with the kind of cultural power in Australia. You know, farmers are all really um, people we need to support, good people. Um, and uh, I think that that's really significant. But a lot of work has been done in Australia and globally around getting the insurance industry, you know, think about bastard industries, that's certainly one of them up there, um, <laughs> one of them in terms of, but I think what was really interesting about the intervention of the insurance industry is that they necessarily have to think, um, you know, long term in terms of, in terms of, and, and they frame very much action on climate change around risk. Um, and then, of course, we've seen some really quite um, strong uh, statements and intentions by the some people, some groups within industry super, particularly HESTA, but more importantly, First State Super around this as well. That leadership is critical. And I think there is a kind of a, a, a kind of a, uh, a, they will drag other industry, um, other industry super um, organisations to the table. And so I think... Um, a lot of that work has been done and it's been done by um, investor groups, it's been done by members internally, of course, a lot of those industry super funds represent um, uh, uh, workers where climate change is consistently mentioned, you know, particularly, for example, um, the midwives, I love the midwives and particularly nurses and midwives and the advocacy they've played here. So it is possible to do. The thing that happens, of course, is you need multiple pressure points all at, from both internal and external, all pushing at that sector and that organisation really to shift. And then of course, you know, then things like the pandemic can happen and organisations lose their nerve. And so people have to find a way to say, well, actually, no, we need to continue to do this because it's going to be critical to that economic recovery. And just finally, one of the things I'm really interested in is the extent to which professional organisations and professions have banded together in the same way as often they did in relation to tobacco. I mean, when I first joined the social and market research industry um, uh, and I worked for Ipsos, we made a decision that we would do no tobacco work. Now, there wasn't a lot of tobacco work around, but we made a decision that that was not good for our brand um, and we did a lot of health prevention work and we couldn't do it. Um, we got to a point too where there was a conversation around poker machines as well, whether we do any work there. But increasingly you're getting professional organisations, um, peak bodies, all collaborations of professional organisations, architects, engineers, healthcare workers of all kinds, veterinarians, lawyers, um, accountants saying, um, not only are we, so everything from we will not work for fossil fuel organisations, or we, and we will have extensive conversations with our other clients about what they're doing around climate change. And so I often feel, what I, what I feel is that, in a sense, every part of civil society and corporations and, profession, and, and professional services are part of that, need to surround 
the minority, and they are the minority of fossil fuel companies and the politicians that they fund and say, we don't want this kind of society and economy anymore, you need to change. So it is possible, there's lots and lots of really heartening case studies and it's going, but it's going to take so much more pressure and so much more um, uh, consistent advocacy for that to really pay off in the time that we've got. Thank you for that. Uh, I've got a question I'll, I'll read out on behalf of uh, Paolo Bini. It's, it's kind of two questions. Um, yeah. One is about how people respond psychologically about uh, cognitive load of just how bad the threat is, i.e. Yeah. they switch off. Um, yeah. Second is like progressive conservatives like the language of things fitting their mental map of the world, things being more traditional, yeah. keeping what we have, yeah. now things really need to be, etc. Yeah. They ask, does your research indicate if this kind of language can work? And finally, Labor has not been upfront about the costs of a climate change plan. Do you think being more honest can make a difference, i.e. cost per individual types of approaches, etc.? Yeah, okay, so there's three questions here. So around the cognitive load, and the other one was around... Um, the language of... Language for conservatives, uh, yeah. Yeah. And the third one was on... It, Whether right, labour should be more... Per up, individual. Up. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would say about cognitive load, I think one of the things... So one of the difficulties, of course, is when you start thinking about to what extent do you... What, how much information do you need to give people about what's at stake to get them to act? Or, and, and there's two different actions, get them to do what you want, vote, spend differently. Another action is to crawl up in, into a ball in the corner with a, a pint of vodka. That's the other action. Right? So it's a, very, it's a constant balance between those. I mean, my general sense is that you actually don't need too much information. And in fact, interestingly, sometimes the more information you provide, the more some of those groups push back on it. You don't need too much information to hint at what could be lost. So going into the book, you know, there was always these, I went in with very, you know, facile and unhelpful statements, but that I still thought were significant, which is, oh, you've got to be positive and you can't scare people, blah, blah, blah. But actually, and this is why I liked writing the chapter about loss, is you do need to hint at what's at stake. People don't act or change at all unless they think the things that matter to them today are going to be taken away or going to be transformed in some way that's problematic. The problem is not the question of, of threat of the things you love. The problem is, is that people don't connect climate change to the things they love. Right? So, so you do have to, it's completely disingenuous to say that, as well as ineffective to say that there isn't something at stake. Um, so you do need to do that. Whether you need to, you don't need to have pages and pages of extracts from, you know, the uninhabitable earth. I would not encourage that at all. Um, but you do need to think about what's at threat. I mean, we're lucky too, is that climate change, even though the modelling is, you know, complicated, so certainly the model is complicated. We can read all the climate change reports and all the rest of it is complicated. But at a fundamental level, it's not that hard to get your head around. Like we're putting all these gases in the atmosphere, it's heating up, things are melting, and it's mucking with our weather patterns. That's actually not that hard for people to understand. In fact, the only people think that, that think that climate change is difficult to understand are the deniers because they want to make it complicated. They want to cherry pick the detail. Everybody else gets it at that kind of high level. So my suggestion, and this is the thing that why the segmentation approach is so important, cognitive load will depend on where you sit and whether you actually, <laughs> you know, how much you balance that threat versus gain or gloss versus gain. On the language around conservatives, um, there's a whole chapter, the chapter on love, which is the final chapter I end in, has a wonderful little example of somebody who was working with bird watchers in America who are often quite conservative to try and get them to act on climate, which was a bit risky for, for this big bird watching organisation in America. But what she did in that 
was get a really strong understanding of essentially the trigger words for conservatives around climate and um, how, how much of the climate story did they need to tell and how much did they need to avoid to get them from the point of view of I'm really worried about birds and whether I'm going to be able to bird watch in the future to you've got to go and see the, you know, the governor or the local politician and make sure that they stop cutting down trees and you know, move away from fossil fuels and all the rest of it. So there is a lot of stuff done around the language that work around climate change that works with conservatives. So I quote a lot from a really fantastic UK um, climate communicator called George Marshall. And in a lot of the work they've done in countries like Australia and, and the United States and America shows that things like renew, repair, restore, you know, retain anything that is all he calls all these rewords that kind of tap into this idea that things are getting lost, almost like a nostalgic thing about that. Um, and in a sense, they're kind of conservation conservative values work extremely well. And also find this idea of um, um, the, the whole concept of recycled energy as being thrifty and you know what I mean kind of just you know it, it, the the kind of the energy equivalent of fixing the broken toaster like let's just you know let's just make sure that the resources we have are used you know effectively and efficiently the problem of course is that the is that um the counterbalance to that is that there is so much that is in the conservative and particularly that male identity around fossil fuels um which also extends to particular love and interest in nuclear energy as well. Um, uh, it's kind of basically energy phallics is phallic um, objects, which is probably why the Craig Kellys and the um, Tony Abbotts of the world are so attracted to them. Um, as opposed to hippie, girly, renewable energy, which is, you know, all the rest of it. So I think that there is a lot, and this is why, this is why the task is not necessarily around convincing people of the science, but finding the kind of language that taps into those already existing values and that emotional response that, effect, that is effective. And finally, the cost per individual, so I'm taking up a lot of time. I mean, that's a, that's a much, much longer question that I might take um, offline. But I think one of the things that has been so incredibly effective Minerals Council are just the most incredibly, shamelessly effective marketers for their product. There is no one better in Australia. No one better. They are just incredibly good at, at making it that the idea that, that if their industry doesn't exist, it's going to cost us every time we buy a banana or every time we walk across the road. Or, and they're incredibly good at amplifying the, um, certainly the number of jobs <laughs> um, that they provide Australians or this I kind of basically they've positioned in most people's minds the idea that if in some way they weren't at the centre of, they are at the centre of Australian economic life and that if we moved away from them even one iota, the tsunami effect through our communities would be beyond anything. And they're just incredibly good at that and that's, that is a very, very good marketing but we have not been that effective at saying there is an enormous cost per person that gets worse every year of not climate of no climate action. And of course, the problem is is that people are much better at connecting um, the idea that a coal mine shuts down and people lose jobs than a fire happens and people lose houses, because the causal link is obvious in one, but it's still being resisted in the other. So that's the challenge. And Paolo says in the chat, fantastic responses. Thanks. So yeah, good okay. questions too, Paolo. Yeah. Um, now I've been meaning to, I'm trying to ask in the chat for uh, Anne Coote, who has a very good question. Um, she's from a large regional agricultural region in New South Wales. So um, I'll just try and see if Anne can ask that question herself. I'm not sure if she's turned off her, her well, chat. She's shy. You are there, Anne. Yes. <laughs> No, I'm here. No, she's not oh, yeah. shy. Good. No, not, at, not at all. Hello, Rebecca. <laughs> um, I guess you've probably put some of my thoughts in perspective um, with answering some of the previous questions, but I, um, I wanted to take the opportunity. I, I really didn't know what I was letting myself in for attending this, this session this evening, but what I was very curious about was to learn 
how do we discuss changes in climate with um, people, our peers, people in our industries, so that we can start to get change happening. And in agriculture, obviously, being uh, the food hub of... Um, Where are you, man? I'm at, in northern New South Wales. Right. Western New South Wales. Yeah. Um, so the, the, my shift for climate change was in about 2000. Um, yet another drought. Um, but it was significant enough for us to make um, our own property changes. I work wow. in industry as well. So there's been a lot of changes happen in agriculture strategically over time with reduced yes. tillage and a whole range of um, different shifts. Yeah. But it's still pretty dominated by industrial agriculture. Yeah. Um, so in about, yeah, from 2000 onwards, I had a distinct interest in um, what are the practices um, that we could actually um, incorporate, whether it be biological farming systems, um, yeah. Yeah. Not, any, not any particular system, but we're talking about practices. Now yeah. I'm very much involved with a, with a movement called the Regenerative Agriculture Movement. Yeah, oh, and wonderful. Um, just learning about it in the last year, it's extraordinary. Yeah, it's very exciting space to be in. Um, now, we've had the same issues, I guess, um, you know, same with the fires, same with climate change, trying to convince people that there is a need for change. And obviously, the, why we need to participate in regenerative agriculture is directly related to climate mm. change. Yeah, um, that is very obvious. And if people haven't worked that one out by now, then you know it's that's that is um, quite odd. But um, it is still people are still, I guess, recalcitrant in their in their thinking and in their yeah. ways to participate and at least understand and agree uh, that yes, this is having an impact. And and really, from my perspective, it's about it's it's climate change is occurring call it what you like, but the impacts are there. And for me in agriculture, food, particularly globally and locally, is going to be one of the things that people as consumers can have a significant impact on yeah. change. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess for me, what I wanted to find out from you, obviously there's, I've done quite a lot of work with understanding why farmers don't change. And a lot of that's to do with psychological peer, um, you know, association with others and that's who they right. grew up with. And Social cues and yeah, their politics and who, when I go to church and all that sort of stuff. But we, it, it, it seems, you know, we've got 10 years left of climate change, but we've only got about somewhere about 30 years left of production, agricultural yeah. production, if we don't change. That yeah. means we're all going to starve. We're not going to be able to eat. Yeah. So we collectively need to start to, um, I think, strategically have a, a much greater impact than we currently are. Yeah. And just wanted your feedback from that perspective um, in terms of uh, what, what are those key messages that, that we yeah. can use to break down that story. So, and I'm so excited um, that you've talked there. I mean, one of the things that happened before all of this is I did do a, a radio documentary and series, a, radio, a long radio documentary and an article on climate adaptation and farmers. It was called, what will climate change do, do to spaghetti bolognese? So it kind of was, again, this is the idea, like how do we make climate change relevant? And everybody kind of pretty much eats spaghetti bolognese. So I took kind of wheat, carrots and beef and thought about what would happen and talked to a lot of primary providers and then did an article on the impact of climate change on wine. I thought that might motivate people. Um, <laughs> but what that made me realise at the time is just the, is that, is that two things and, and that the research has um, supported is that if you're going to kind of do a full frontal assault on um, people in regional and rural communities, and I come from an Italian regional community in northern Queensland that grew, grew cane, and my father's family from um, regional South Australia um, that um, are also in agriculture. So I know the mindset. If, if getting them to believe and engage with climate change and act on climate change means making them not vote for the National Party or rethink their entire conservative agenda, like their conservative identity, it's not going to work. You're just going to be doing this. But the capacity for um, uh, farmers in different kinds of sectors to adapt and change, often with the support of um, researchers in regional universities, 
often being underfunded under this government. Is quite astounding. There's lots and lots of extraordinary case studies and the regenerative agriculture um, and the success of that movement is kind of one example. We're being let down, I think, a bit by leadership. And so, you know, there's a huge, there's quite obviously, as you know, a bit of resistance in the National Party to the idea that they would engage in these questions. But this is why things like the Farmers Federation coming up and other groups, and particularly at um, um, different parts of, I mean, the wine industry in Australia has been pretty good around climate change as well is really critical. But I wonder if we can take this conversation offline. I can send you some resources and particularly also give you some information about what our segmentation is showing about the most effective frames to be used in regional, regional and rural, different parts of regional and rural Australia to get people to engage with climate action. Um, so I'm really happy to go offline with that if you want to um, contact Luke directly, um, then we'll email and talk. I love it when a plan comes together. It's brilliant. Uh, I've just got a comment from Alex Simpson. Coffee is in danger too, apparently. So oh, yeah. Coffee, wine and pasta. <laughs> you can't get people uh, exercised on those things, then please. Um, <clears throat> we're getting pretty close to, to wrapping up. I know you've been very, very busy. Uh, I'm just wondering whether I could slip in one last nice. question. Um, it's from Dr. Victoria, Victoria Kearney or, or Kearney. Um, it is a bit more political and you, you know, yeah. we do know each other from that sphere. Um, yeah. How do we change attitudes or the emotional response within political parties, the Greens and the ALP, to enable collaboration and alliances to win government for a climate safe government? Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, we have, I don't, I don't want to go into the, you know, nitty gritty of why Labor and Greens hate <laughs> are at loggerheads, but it's been one of the many structural problems in politics that has meant that we haven't quite been able to nail this. But I think that we get a bit distracted by that. I think that um, those alliances are important will become stronger. What we really need to do, and I'm absolutely unashamed about this, is we need to do two things. We need to reform at the federal level our donation system. There is absolutely no transparency. We have absolutely no understanding of how much the fossil fuel industry gives individual politicians because of the opaque nature of political donations. We need to make that absolutely clear. I mean, it's pretty clear. I mean, you, I mean, for every Clive Palmer direct intervention, I'm worried about the indirect intervention. And we really do need to look at people who are both climate deniers and I would say really disingenuous climate recalcitrants. So people that say, oh, climate change is happening and government should do something, therefore we're going to put a lot of money in gas. Um, we, <laughs> we really do need to, um, we need to do whatever we can to um, get them out of parliament, which is why, um, you know, I think one of the most effective things that we can do is support climate conscious conservatives um, uh, and um, across the country um, because, they're, um, because they're a critical part of the shift that needs to happen and highlight the really damaging effect of deniers, which is why Zali Stegall, even though she's a conservative, her, um, we need more of those kinds of people because that shift in the Liberal Party is, um, really has to happen. So those are, I think, the two things that I would like to see happen politically. And I think that that will then hopefully make um, the kind of relationships between Labor and the Greens, which are fraught and really demoralising, I've got to say, for anybody who wants climate action and doesn't, isn't just one-eyed one about either the Labor Party or the Greens, um, perhaps more possible. We did promise that we'd let you get out of here by seven. Yes, so, I've got a focus group to do about the fires. Oh, there we go. All right, well, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to do is allow everybody in the um, chat now to send your message or send other comrades that they've heard from. Now you can talk to everyone in the chat section, but my main duty, of course, is to thank you so much for, for coming. I've just posted the link to buy the book again. There it is. Um, thank you. It's been wonderful. Um, I'm going to give you the final word and then once you've uh, had the final word, I'm going to play a song. You can stick nice. around or you can go. Everyone else can send each other messages, send me messages. Um, our next event uh, we'll announce tomorrow will be with Paddy Manning, uh, our comrade, uh, writer, journalist who's written about the victims of climate change. Uh, it's part of September being a month of real focus on this because we've got the student strike, uh, strike for climate on the 25th of September, which we're 
uh, keen to support and we'll actually have a, a seminar for uh, search members to have a, a discussion about that as well that's in the works so thank you very much for coming thank you very much Rebecca I'll let you have the final word then I'll play a, a song during which time people can chat to each other my final word is just um, is just uh, I wish you all a kind of resolute hope and um, sceptical optimism that together we can um, do something about climate change and um, there is always solace in activism with like-minded people. So it's just wonderful um, to spend this hour with you um, on a, is it a Wednesday night? Wednesday night. Wednesday night, indeed. That's right. Time is very elastic in the pandemic, even in New South Wales. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. Uh